Kia ora everyone, my name is Andrea and some of you will know me from previous webinars. I have been hosting a number of webinars now. We have two more to go. We started this in April and um, yeah, we are finishing in a couple of weeks, unfortunately. So I hope you all enjoyed it. All of the webinars and the um, related chapters that people contributed as a basis for our discussions are avail available on our um, PSA website. So um, have a look around. If you if missed any of the webinars, check them out there and share them with your friends and colleagues if you liked it. Um, they are all part of a series called Progressive Thinking that we have started a number of years back in the PSA. And we have done, um, we have published a few booklets, one on tax, one on housing, one on the future of work, and they are also available on our website and you can download them and have a look. This um, particular um, webinar series is, um, uh, or is run under the, the big framework of the future of public and community um, services and that booklet will be published later this year. So you will um, get a nice neat publication of all the contributions um, soon as well. So that's probably all I have to uh, say in terms of what this webinar is all about. I'll just give you a quick run through um, how we do these uh, webinars. We'll have a quick introduction. After that, uh, my two guests today, usually I only have one, so this is very special. Um, my two guests will um, uh, present their ideas for about 10 minutes and then we'll have a conversation. And I um, would like to invite you all to use the question answer function to post your questions. And I will bring them into the conversation where I can. Keep them nice and short, that makes it much easier. And um, also the questions that remain um, unanswered in our conversation today, Jackie and Leslie have agreed to um, answer your questions afterwards. So do post them, you will definitely get an answer now in the webinar or later on. So. Um, it's worthwhile, I think, um, uh, participating in the conversation. So, yeah, that's, that's really all. So let's, let's do our round of introductions. A very, very warm welcome to you, um, Jacqueline Cumming, Consultant, Advisor in Health Services Research and Policy, and Leslie Middleton, Senior Lecturer, Victoria University School of Health. And um, as always, with all of my guests, I have um, had a conversation earlier in the week and I have asked you for your three <laughs> words that describe you or your work, your motivation for your work. And um, Leslie, you have told me that your three words are curious, reflective and mosaic. And Jackie, your three words are equity, research and policy. So maybe we'll start with you, Leslie. Um, explain a little bit why you chose that words and what they mean to you. Thanks, Andrea. Yes, yeah, always a challenge encompassing yourself and your whole being in three words. Um, but I chose reflective because it is the thing you do, particularly in qualitative research, which I enjoy a lot, which is, you know, thinking in advance, interviewing people, going away and reflecting on what's happening, which um, sort of plays into the curious word as well, which I'm always curious about what's happening, particularly when big abstract things like systems and how you ground them down into personal experiences for people. And then I chose mosaic just because like everyone you think your career is going to be one straight line at, at, at the beginning and particularly because I work with a lot of students now um, just at the beginning of their careers and I think oh for me personally it's just been this fascinating mosaic of stepping on a whole lot of different stones at different times and seeing seeing the world from different perspectives so I started as an applied 
researcher actually in, um, in government, in internal affairs, doing a lot of community development work, but then I moved into health and did more um, health services research, and then I moved into policy, and I did a lot of science policy and looking at science and then representing um, New Zealand Science Internationally, but then back in a, well, in a university now teaching health policy. So for me, they were all sort of stepping stones. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jackie. Oh, thanks, Andrea, and kia ora tato. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending today. Um, so, yeah, I chose equity research and policy. I started off in, in policy roles in different government agencies, including first off really labour market policy um, and then moved into health and one of the key things for me was well how do we know whether many of the things that we're actually doing in health or to the health system actually make a difference and really do work so that is how I then got really interested in research and following that through in terms of look understanding that New Zealand didn't have a really strong health services research or health policy research role. And uh, so I've been working on that now for about 26, 27 years. And the aim is to produce research that's really useful for policymakers. And one of the drivers around that is then around equity. So understanding how it is that um, services do actually work for the people that are using them, how people get access to them, what the implications are for equity of outcomes, um, and meeting our obligations under the treaty. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Fantastic. Thank you both. Um, so let's go straight to um, your presentation, sharing your ideas and your, your reflections on, you entitled your chapter with um, our health system um, and services, a best possible future. And uh, you will explain to us surely um, what you mean by that. And I know you covered uh, some, some scenarios, future scenarios as well, that um, our participants will be very interested in. So um, yeah, please, you have round about 10 minutes to um, give us a, an overview of your thinking and um, we'll have a conversation after that. Thank you. Thanks. Andrea, and yes, um, kia ora tato, everyone. So um, I, I was going to kick, kick off and then pass to Jackie. And then as we, um, as we drafted our paper, we tried to think about a, a kind of unifying idea to encompass something as complex as health, health sector change, futures thinking. And we came up with this idea of a river um, because health systems are really static. And we are just reaching almost a reflection point, a kind of bend in the river where we've had a big um, health and disability services review that Jackie will talk more about. But I thought it's really good to sort of stand back and look at the journey of the health system in the context of what we've learned from what's happened before in health reform and thinking about particularly um, the journey we've been on is one about trying to move away just from hospitals and sickness into, into one that's about wellness and prevention and all the ways we've thought about reorientating our health system. And it's interesting to look at the period, I mean, both Jackie and I sort of experienced this period as well in the, in the 90s when we went through a whole lot of rapids in the health system, looking at big organisational changes around policy purchasing and provision, um, basically based around ideas of contracting and competition to get more efficiency. And, and the reform, I won't go into great detail, and in fact, I'm sure some of your audience might have experienced that before, you know, experienced that period before as well. And I mean, the reform ledger on that comes out really recognising that um, there was a real rejection, both from New Zealanders and health providers of this for profit driven model, or even a model that was trying to um, actually have a lot of competition in the sector. People actually didn't feel that's what they wanted their health sector to do. Um, and there was equally a lot of learning as Jackie's written about as well, about how the costs expected to um, 
actually, uh, you know, the cost gains expected to be achieved never, were never really realised as well. So you do see a lot of ambitious expectations for change that often aren't realised in health sector reform. But equally, if you weigh up the reform ledger on the other side, we, it did open up opportunities for Māori and Pacifica providers as well. So rather than a health sector that was just closed to all new incumbents, that was already garnering up the resources just in a few places with, with hospitals, a lot of there were people spotting opportunities and thinking about population health and doing really interesting things. So at that time as well, I am um, just as we came to the end of that decade, which was quite fraught and had four big structural changes in, in a very small number of years. We got to the end with DHBs and primary healthcare organisations, but at the same time, we started to think as part of a project looking at what the health system would look like in 2020. And um, I dusted off these four, oh, actually there were five scenarios. and. Um, went round last year and interviewed some people who were involved to see, well, how well did we um, spot signals or miss signals about where we are today? And just what, what have we learned along the way? Because I think what's important to realise is that scenarios are not just predictions of what will happen. They are just trying to open up alternative conversations about what the future could look like. And, so interesting to look at the conversations we thought might be going around and realize as I went through in my interviews with people, some of those conversations are ones we're having now, others are slightly more buried. So um, we had a scenario around uh, a technocrat's dream. So a big expectation that technology and data would be transformational. I think we're still writing those words about the health sector. We haven't kind <laughs> of got there yet. Um, we had a scenario, um, actually one to avoid, two tiers, which was the worry we'd end up with um, just a small safety net in the public system with a large provision of health sector actually running through a private insurance idea. And that was one people didn't want to have happen, but equally knowing what you want to avoid can be sometimes as powerful as knowing where you want to go. We had a scenario looking at... Um, it's power to the people. So this was one actually that did spot some early signals around population health, community empowerment, different ways of thinking about um, well-being rather than just sickness. So it had some early glimmers of the well-being budget and some of the thinking that's around now. And then we also had one which was reflected, I think, some of the economic thinking of the time that if we all had um, global healthcare plans that gave us packages of healthcare services that we could buy, that that would open up a lot of individual choice. So there was a sort of uh, a very much a structural planned um, choice consumer sovereignty scenario, which I think I haven't seen anywhere in the world since, but it was a popular thing to talk about at the time. And then we had a muddling through, which is a bit of everything, um, which often is incremental change as well and what, what you could expect to see. So it was really interesting to think, in fact, we did have the ability to imagine quite an interesting health sector there, albeit in a, in a small way. But what we'd seen since the creation of DHBs and PHOs is fairly incremental change in the health sector. I think after those big rapid filled 90s, there was a real weariness of organisational reform. And we had this um, sort of, yeah, rather sluggish but slow movement towards trying to do a lot of new things around population health. And, and the people that stepped up, the Murray and Iwi providers and the Pacifica providers that stepped up were still trying to do really new interesting initiatives that both Jackie and I have been part of evaluating. But we've sort of reached a period now where we're, um, we've got this health and disability system review that's, um, I think, maybe going to tip us into this eddy of change. And I, I'm de we're deliberately calling it a swirl because there are so many recommendations in this report, it's hard to hold on to the one that, that will be moved on first, that might be the game changer. The implementation details are sketchy. 
but equally the whole swirl around COVID would make you think, well, how is that also changing our thinking? So yeah, some interesting ideas in the report and people may want to, and we've, we've outlined some of these as well, and people may want to ask about those, but I do think um, it's, it's really interesting to consider this, as I say, this water metaphor is where we're at and what this, what this eddy might look like that I'm sure um, others might be experiencing as well at the moment. Right, thank you. Jackie, do you want to add to that? Yes, um, so I'll just add a few points that we've put into the paper. Um, so I think the first thing is that Aotearoa New Zealand does have a health system that is the envy of many other countries. It does deliver high quality care at reasonable expenditure. Um, everybody gets access to most services. It's got a really skilled and dedicated workforce and so on. So many other countries look to us and we've got a reasonably um, less complex system than many other countries actually do. Having a small country, national central government, which actually directs a lot of where the expenditure goes and so on. So those are all really useful things. Um, but like every other country, we've also got some issues, many of which are actually quite long standing issues. And these are the ones that Leslie and I have kind of pointed to as we'd like to see these things kind of being um, worked on over the next little while. And some of those include, the first obvious one is around major inequities in health and access. So not everybody in New Zealand gets, um, has the best health and wellbeing they can have, nor do they have the best range of access to services either. And that's in particular in relation to Māori Health, Pacific Health, people on lower incomes, people with disabilities and rural New Zealanders as well. There's also a major inequity between ACC and health um, that I personally would also very much like to see some work done on how we can actually bring the two sectors together because uh, it's very unfair in the sense of if you have an accident and you're covered by ACC, you get better services and a wider range more quickly than you do under health, as well as the income um, related payments that you get paid if you're off work. Um, Another issue relating to our health sector is that we often are dealing with quite a narrow concept of health and health services, uh, and we need to be thinking more about the determinants of health, like housing, employment, education, and so on. And one of the big issues over time has been how do we actually shift the system to think more about um, health promotion and illness prevention. One of the key issues is that we have quite complex funding rules that differ across services and programs, which actually can make it difficult for people to get exactly the mix of services that they need. And of course, we also have ongoing cost barriers as well as other barriers such as transport, um, availability of caregivers and so on that make it difficult for people to access primary health care as well. Our funding in terms of primary health care over the last little while has been quite inequitable and hasn't been reviewed for a while. And in fact, that was one of the drivers of having the health system review. We've got some services that have been long-standing poor cousins like primary mental health care, disability support and dental care, where it would be great to see more work done as well. And then a more recent issue over the last 20 years or so has focused on fragmentation. People move around the system a lot. They see a lot of different health professionals and often information doesn't follow the, the person um, or it gets lost or there's some kind of gap or they get different advice from different providers and so on. Um, and this is an area which has had a lot of attention in recent years internationally and where New Zealand can still do better as well. And just finally, another issue is around um, the involvement of communities and service users in decision making. That was something which we aimed for more of from the 2000 reforms in terms of primary health care, but we actually haven't got there yet. So thinking about the health system review, it's done a really good job of actually documenting a lot of different issues uh, in relation to the current system, which has been in place since the year 2000. So it's been around more or less the same sort of form since for 20 years or so, that's quite a long period of time. So the review does, rec does recognise a lot of the strength of the system, but then points to a lot of things that we've actually pointed to in our paper as well, as well as around issues to do with who makes what decisions at what levels, and that issue around how much national consistency is there versus how much local decision making there actually is, and also making sure that the system has um, more 
clear plans in place in terms of where it's actually heading for the future. So it lays out uh, a number of recommendations which actually then are about restructuring the healthcare system, setting up a new agency, Health NZ, to work with district health boards, reducing down the number of district health boards, putting in place a much stronger kind of planning framework, and also focusing more on locality decision making as well. And um, I guess one of the things that we're sort of asking the question about really is, you know, if, if you go through all of that, we know from experience that structural reform takes an awful lot of time. You don't always get the outcomes that you actually want. And we wouldn't be sure that some of those issues that we've raised would actually be dealt with in the immediate future while we're all focused on reforming the healthcare system. So that would be a good set of things for us to talk about. Um, in terms of COVID, um, it, New Zealand will come out well, I think, you know, internationally again, when, when we look at the international response in terms of COVID. Yes, we've had a number of different issues, but we are dealing with something that's very new. And there's a lot of people out there working really hard to make sure that we keep the virus at bay, but also developing a whole lot of new policies and programs that are then designed to help us economically to get out of the economic issues that we may now face because of COVID. So on the one hand, it's kind of shown that we can do things when we really, really want to, and it would be great to see that kind of impetus actually brought into some of, thinking about some of those issues that we've actually identified in relation to healthcare um, over the next few years. So thank you. Wow, yeah, thank you so much. Um, a lot of information, very, very rich in, you know, historical information, but also um, uh, what is what is going on right now in terms of the health and disability system review. So thank you for that. Um, maybe the first point that I would like to touch on, both of you mentioned um, the importance of prevention and well-being that is guiding the, or should be guiding the health system. And, um, you have mentioned that um, a shift is necessary to really implement and ensure prevention is happening early, prevention is happening for the well-being of, of people. So what are some concrete steps to achieve that? Um, what, what needs to be shifted in order to achieve it? Okay, so I'll start on that. And Lizzie, if you want to add some more, that would be great. Um, so I, I think one of the things uh, is going to be, you know, much greater attention to the social determinants of health. We, we've had over the last mm, 10 years or so a major um, problem with housing. So that's one really major area where we really need to get that sorted out in order to have better housing, better quality housing, more housing in the right places for the right sized whanau. Um, so that's one major issue. And I think another big issue is, that's going to come up soon is going to be around employment. Um, we don't want to see too many New Zealanders out of jobs and their incomes dropping significantly. So that would be another major area to look at. But then the other side of that, I think, is, is that sort of local um, focus on working with local communities and having much more focus on um, nutrition, physical activity, local environments which encourage more activity, um, things like, you know, more vegetable gardens and so on that people can access fresh food and so on. So much more of that community-based um, work where people in the community can work with their own communities to actually, you know, um, encourage people to lead healthy lives and have the environment around them that will actually support that. It sounds like just just a, a quick question in between, Leslie, if you want to sure. add something. But the work with the communities, that, that is such an important um, aspect that comes up in, in many webinars. And I guess, or I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's not sufficient um, for communities just to develop local um, Lo local initiatives, for example, to improve nutrition or stop smoking, those kind of things. But they need to be brought into that broader strategic and policy development as well, I guess, and that voice needs to be heard. Is, is that correct? And how would we do that? How would we better do that? Yeah, I, th I think that is correct. And we have had attempts at doing this. So um, back in the 2000s, we had a focus on healthy eating, healthy action, which actually had a strong community 
emphasis to it in terms of um, some of its funding being allocated at a community level and to community resources. And also Healthy Families, which is also in place at the moment, also has that strong community focus as well. So we do have examples of how we can actually do it. It's just they tend to be funded as small short term um, pilots and then the funding doesn't really ever continue or we alter it five years later and we try again. Leslie, would you like to um, add? I just wanted to add, because one thing, and Jackie and I had been discussing after reading the, the review report, they, they do recommend um, locality groupings, mm. doing a lot more of what Jackie just beautifully described. Um, the issue is, though, both, I mean, two issues really. Um, so much other organisational change recommended. The worry is that that becomes the thing you do last, when in actual mm -hmm. fact that could be the biggest changer, game changer. But equally, if you're trying to set up all these big uh, national structures, it's likely everyone will wait till those are set up before they actually start to think what's going to work at all these local levels. But um, there are as Jackie was saying, great examples of initiatives now doing things. But one of, um, and, and just reflecting a colleague, Anna Matheson, some work she just wrote up about this as well is, but it does need these backbone organisations as well that kind of create the scale and the synthesis for people. And some of the discussion I've seen in health is, well, uh, general practice, these backbone organisations, or will people trust them? They're very much a medically based organisation. Local government could be another backbone type of thinking. They've got more of a, a kind of community democratic rather than an expert as, aspect. I know Healthy Families has worked with her. It does need the ability to synthesise a whole lot of activity and build it to scale and use data well. And so I think trying to think through what are the what are the arrangements that drive those forward at a big scale is really interesting to think about. And yeah, you know, one of the worries I have is looking at um, just hearing from people who are in those groups now in the health sector, a bit dismayed that they aren't going to be able to go ahead because of all this organisational change that's now going to take everyone's time and attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was just um, uh, thinking about um, the importance of social determinants, and um, I couldn't agree more in, in this, you know, society that we live. I mean, everything is interrelated, be it, um, as you said, be it work, where you live, um, how you live your life, um, if, you, if you have family, if you live in a, in a rural community or an urban community. Um, and it, it seems like a bringing in social determinants um, seems like a more holistic approach to viewing the world of health, if you like. And um, that brings me to um, the idea of Fana Aura, of course, which is a holistic um, uh, approach and philosophy of health and development. And you talked a little bit about it in the paper, and you also mentioned the importance of Mari and Pacifica um, providers. So is that something that um, we should actually take on board as a, as a general kind of approach and philosophy for the health system that would actually lift the health of all of us? And it's not just something specific um, uh, for Mari and, and Pacifica in this case. Uh, so yes, I would say yes, that, that as a philosophy, it, it brings in that holistic view of health and recognises the importance of those social determinants of health. And so not just focusing on the, the medical side of health at all, but bringing in all those wider issues. Um, so as a philosophy, absolutely, I think that's exactly right. Um, Whanawar, the way it's partly set up at the moment, is targeting resources at particular Fano, And there's... Um, I think the first thing is that if we have that sort of underlying philosophy and allow more groups to come in to be delivering services in, in that way, that would allow greater choice for people and also the, the right populations getting the right mix of services that they actually need. Not everybody needs the um, range of services that are set up under Whanawara, but there are still many families who would benefit. 
do you want to add anything, Leslie? Or no, I or? think, I mean, that sense though, and I think Jackie's put a finger on it well that um, yes, we've had a universal health system offering the same to everyone, but there are pro equity policies that we also need to think about that are really deepening the the sort of sense of support to those that for whom the gains will be greater, and that's still what we're balancing through. And and you can see that run through the report as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, moving on from a from an overall system um, sort of. Um, approach to change or transformation of the system. Um, we have a lot of people um, on the call who work in the health system, I would imagine, health and community um, public services. So what, what do you think people can do in their respective roles at work, um, but also outside of work? Because, you know, it's, uh, we need to think holistically in the sense. Um, what can people do and groups of people collectively in order to contribute to, you know, a reduction of inequities um, in health? Is there anything you, you could share on that? That's a big question, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, I mean, there's great work looking at systemic racism, just understanding um, all the different layers that um, can be barriers in the system that uh, people can think more consciously about and question their own. I mean, I think that sense of um, just cultural understanding, and it's not, as a colleague says, not just understanding someone else's culture, it's being aware of your own culture and your own biases that you bring. And, and there's been some really interesting work in the sector, just both, um, working through Tariti partnerships, thinking about equity, but and gathering evidence on the hope that evidence is a spur for change. But I think there's a whole lot of other ways that people are a, a spur for change and thinking differently. And certainly for me, it was very powerful listening to the testimony at the uh, Y2575 tribunal and just, yeah, hearing what that experience has been like for Māori, particularly in the primary healthcare sector and, thinking through all the different, not just making services more accessible, but thinking through all the different ways um, there are barriers in the system that could be actually overturned, yeah. And I think just to add to that, um, I, I, uh, keeping up the great work that everybody does already, I mean, most New Zealanders, when they need to access services, they're really satisfied and pleased with the services that they get and they always talk about the great staff as well um, so keeping that up but also I think thinking about you know when there's a major you know when you're looking at the way in which services are delivered how can you make it easier for people to kind of navigate the system because it is really complicated for people coming in especially if they're coming in for the first time um, to actually understand how it all works take in all the information that they actually need so thinking that through and but then also thinking through you know what are the services that are being delivered and how how do they work well or not for the local community and how can that local community actually become more involved in discussions about how things might be different. Now, one of the issues that we know is that when New Zealand tries to do these kinds of projects, um, what tends to happen is that people have their day job they have to be doing and then they get given other responsibilities as well in relation to thinking about how things might improve. And that's really not going to be helpful because people just get overwhelmed with the amount of work and they can't get on with it. So one of the key things is that we have adequate res resourcing for people when they're thinking about how they might do things differently. Yeah, thank you. We have, um, going back to the to the health system as such, we have one question. It, it, it seems very easy and straightforward, but I guess it's quite challenging to answer. Um, it is about the biggest um, fault of our health system today. What would be the one big thing that you would change if you were in power right now? What would you turn around? I mean, I... <laughs> Personally. I know, this is a, this is a big one, but yeah. the, good, the good news is there's no right or wrong no. here, right? Uh, because you could pick probably uh, several things and, and try to make a change. 
um, but what potentially would be um, the one thing that you know um, gives the, the 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 biggest um, biggest amount of change, and not just quantitatively but qualitatively for people's outcomes? Um, is there anything you that would come to mind straight away? I I mean. I think I would think the review did start looking at primary health care that but then became this big look at the whole system and I think then the emphasis for really doing that differently and supporting it differently then got lost so for me it's still putting our energy into thinking how we actually do the primary health care part of the health sector better we are you know the hospital is obviously really valuable for all of us and I don't want to dismiss it but I just think we still haven't kind of cracked that sense that that is the place that's easy to measure, that absorbs the bulk of the funding, that's, you know, we, we, we seem to, um, and, and quite rightly, New Zealanders expect good quality secondary care, and why wouldn't they? But I just think in terms of really the change potential, it's there really um, working at primary and community health and just trying to set up some more synthesized structures around those would be valuable. Yes, I agree. And I think actually also bringing in that broader concept of whanawara and, ha and having those options available for groups in the population as well at that primary health care and community care level. It makes me think a little bit about a webinar um, that we had just a few weeks ago where uh, we talked about systems and you know how systems um, interrelate and and how they are very dynamic and that we always tend to um, try to control systems right in an ever complex complex and and changing environment I suppose and I guess that's true for health as well and my guest suggested that instead of optimizing for control we should be optimizing for learning because that's what we can do in order to um, change incrementally. We, we need to learn from the different situations, adapt, learn again, and that's how we make improvements rather than coming up with lo very long-term plans and control the outcomes or focus on the accountabilities. And um, I was wondering what you're thinking about that and how it could be integrate how we can integrate more learning into our health system and to make it more adaptable as well over time and to improve um, the transformational outcomes that it could bring about. Yeah, I think that's nicely said, Andrea. And, and I'm conscious that, um, I mean, there's great work around quality improvement initiatives in the health sector already doing a lot of that small scale learning. Sometimes um, just some of the ones that I've evaluated, which do a tremendous job, but are quite hospital based. It can be quite difficult to build them into the primary and community sector. And it's partly Jackie's point as well, that they become another task on top of everyone else's day job as well. But I do think it's, and I think we mentioned this in our paper, that agile response to COVID is a really interesting example of, of a learning system. and just a reflection of what's happened in the UK where they set up these large Nightingale hospitals on the expectation that there would be this flood of intensive care beds needed. Mm -hmm. And the sense is actually the intensive care practitioners learnt very quickly through blogs and sharing information and all sorts of ways to manage people that in fact that centralised control planning um, result of these big hospitals was actually not as needed as much as actually the thing that supported small scale learning both internationally as well as um, locally around how to manage people with COVID and I thought that was an interesting lesson for all of us because the review put such a strong emphasis on better planning in the sector but we've done so many amazing plans we're really good at writing the words but um, we haven't seen the, um, often we just haven't been as good as the implementation and just learning and bringing that back up and then adjusting as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I think that is a really important message for the future as, a, as around that, 
learning focus. Um, and even if the health system review recommendations that you get put in place, there'll still be a lot of things kind of happening underneath, but it'd be great to be able to kind of learn from them. And for me, that also points to you know, how skewed our current health um, research funding often is, and we, we need more resources put in at the community level um, and to learn from the, the, all the different quality improvement projects and experiments that kind of go on and then be able to work collaboratively to actually be able to scale up the ones that work. This has been a long-standing issue in New Zealand as well, but it needs really significant attention paid to it if the system's truly going to learn over time. Do you think in terms of the, um, the health and disability system review, do you think, because my first reading was that there was a str really strong emphasis on accountability. Mm. And um, while we need to improve that in certain areas, I was a bit surprised that, you know, the emphasis was so strong. Would you, would you say it was, or how from your research and from your findings, would you have placed the emphasis on accountability as well? Or should it have been more on, on learning and, for example, community engagement, these kind of things that you um, raised um, earlier on in the webinar as well? I mean, to be fair to review, everything's there. There's accountability and there's community. You know, they've, they've really picked up a whole lot of stuff. But like you, I saw these new agencies in the hope that somehow or other they'll have better data and better people and do better planning. And I just wasn't quite sure where all this betterness was going to come from um, because somehow they'll now be able to hold these various agencies to account. As I said, I think... For me, looking back at our future scenarios, thinking people, we've been so optimistic about technology and data, yet um, we still seem to be waiting for the big insights that it, it will give us to managing our system. So perhaps these new agencies will be able to bring them together and then that helps. It's actually what, you, what are you gonna be able to hold people accountable to something they can do something about will always be the big question as well, yeah. 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 I, I just want to briefly touch on um, a private versus um, publicly delivered um, services, because you're also, um, you touch on it in your historical description of, especially of the 90s, where the focus was on um, uh, changing to more contracting, uh, a competition-based system to increase efficiencies, and so on and so forth. And... Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that was um, one of the, you know, main drivers or at least like a, a catalyst for the gap um, of excess and outcomes in terms of health services increasing. Um, would, you, would you, from your research, would you agree with that? Or, um, and would you say that um, public services would be um, achieving better outcomes in terms of equity and access, or is <laughs> is that um, is is that not proven through research? Uh, so, so just coming talking about the first part of that question, Andrea, um, the 1990s reform. I think that there are still some legacies out there in terms of ha um, some people, you know, remembering the strong focus on competition. And with the current sort of contracting and accountability frameworks that some people still work under, they still kind of feel that, that that's actually there and that they're in competition with each other and so on. In terms of, though, the impact on equity, uh, there is evidence out there about when those inequities actually started to get worse and, and what seems to have caused them. And they really go back to the you know, 1980 reforms, um, which put a lot of people out of work, and then the 1990 benefit cuts as well, which also had a, a long-standing impact, and we haven't even really properly addressed those yet. And you can see in the data that that's where some of the inequities are actually coming from. Um, and at times, they have actually started to close up when we have kind of looked, when we've got better employment rates, when, when the benefits of levels have actually been raised and so on. Um, I think in terms of that, that discussion about private versus public uh, provision, that's a very difficult um, question to answer and to think about. Um, I think we, 
you know, I think those public values can be really important in terms of service delivery, but we can't get away from the fact that we do have a, a strong private sector working, particularly in primary health care, but also when you think about local communities or iwi or hapu groups, they're effectively going to be private, um, if perhaps not for profit. And uh, it's difficult to get kind of evidence about which groups deliver better because often it's driven by what the system actually looks like, how the funding actually works, um, and so on and so forth. But I personally would like to see Iwi Hapu Pacifica groups um, be able to access more primary health care community care resources and bring about that focus on whanaora for their communities. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I think we are um, running out of time. Um, do you have any research um, that you are undertaking in relation to COVID maybe as a last kind of or burning research question? I would be quite interested uh, what, what an academic is, is thinking about the situation at the moment and, and where it leads you with your thinking and your research. So I'll start with that. Um, so yes, I've been writing a little bit about the um, response for um, a, an international sort of organisation and I'm going to be writing a paper about this a little bit later in the year. Um, and mainly focusing on, you know, blogs, reports, and all the material that's kind of around about how our response has actually worked, and then thinking about what's actually happened in other countries as well. So I'm still very much at the early days of thinking about COVID. But to me, I think we've done really well. And hopefully we will have learnt a lot about what works best in these kinds of circumstances for the future. Um, and there'll probably also be some lessons about how different parts of the health system have worked well together too, and how we can make that work for the longer term as well. Thank you. Leslie, do you have a new project on as well? Well, um, I'm with a team that did do some work during um, the lockdown around people's experience of um, telehealth with primary health care. So the way, um, you know, primary health care had to pivot very quickly to other forms of consultation, you know, um, video and phone. And actually we had a survey out where people talked about their experience of that. And it was really revealing in some ways about, obviously there are conditions for which it's not ideal, but for lots of other conditions, it was really convenient for people. It was actually a number of people saying this is so much easier way to access primary care so and I also think it's a credit to the practices out there that were able to pivot so quickly and deliver in such an agile way um, really positive feedback overall from the survey so just a credit to the system about how agile it can be but just a reminder that it's so easy to design health systems that work for providers and a good reminder how being um, you know being online is so much can be so much more convenient for a number of people as well for particular conditions yeah mm -hmm. we're just writing that up now yeah cool thank you thank you do share your research with yeah. us I'm definitely <laughs> interested in in reading it so thank you so much for for sharing your your ideas and your reflections on the health system you Obviously, you have more than 20 years experience working in that area. So it was very rich and, and very informative. So thank you very much for that. Um, there will be a few unanswered questions. So um, we will get them to you. Um, Jackie Some lovely and reflections there, Andrea, about things that are happening already. And I like, I love the comment about how sometimes that can be invisible, some yeah. of the work that's happening. And I, I do really support that idea of making that, that work visible, because sometimes you worry the review mm. has not spotted the things that it wants to build on out there. Yeah. Mm. No, thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, just to just to announce the next webinar, so we won't have one next week. It will be on the 16th of September, and I'm going to talk to Andrea Black about tax transfers and other payments. So quite different to the health system, but um, important for the health system at the same time, because uh, the money needs to come from somewhere. 
So thank you so much, you two. And I hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you to everyone who listened. And please share what you what you heard and your own reflections on it. And um, I will just say thank you and stay well. Thanks, Andrea. Bye, everyone. Yes, bye. Kira. <laughs>